This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemma Blythe. Moll Flanders by Daniel Defoe. Section 6. I loved the company, indeed, of men of mirth and wit, men of gallantry and figure, and was often entertained with such as I was also with others. But I found by just observation that the brightest men came upon the dullest errand, that is to say, the dullest, as to what I aimed at. On the other hand, those who came with the best proposals were the dullest and most disagreeable part of the world. I was not averse to a tradesman, but then I would have a tradesman, forsooth. That was something of a gentleman, too. That when my husband had a mind to carry me to the court or to the play, he might become a sword and look as like a gentleman as another man, and not be one that had the mark of his apron strings upon his coat or the mark of his hat upon his periwig, that should look as if he was set on to his sword when his sword was put on to him, and that carried his trade in his countenance. Well, at last I found this amphibious creature, this land-water thing called a gentleman tradesman, and as a just plague upon my folly, I was catched in the very snare which, as I might say, I laid for myself. I said for myself, for I was not trepanned, I confess, but I betrayed myself. This was a draper, too, for though my comrade would have brought me to a bargain for a brother, yet when it came to the point it was, it seems, for a mistress, not a wife, and I kept true to this notion, that a woman should never be kept for a mistress that had money to keep herself. Thus my pride, not my principle, my money, not my virtue, kept me honest, though, as it proved, I found I had much better have been sold by my she comrade to her brother than have sold myself, as I did, to a tradesman that was rake, gentleman, shopkeeper, and beggar altogether. But I was hurried on by my fancy to the gentleman to ruin myself in the grossest manner that every woman did. For my new husband, coming to a lump of money at once, fell into such a profusion of expense that all I had, and all he had before, if he had anything worth mentioning, would not have held it out above one year. He was very fond of me for about a quarter of a year, and what I got by that was that I had the pleasure of seeing a great deal of my money spent upon myself, and, as I may say, had some of the spending it too. Come, my dear, says he to me one day, shall we go and take a turn into the country for about a week? Ah, oh, my dear, says I, whither would we go? I care not whither, says he, but I have a mind to look like quality for a week. We'll go to Oxford, says he. How, says I, shall we go? I am no horsewoman, and tis too far for a coach. Too far, says he, no place is too far for a coach and six. If I carry you out, you shall travel like a duchess. Hm, mm, says I, my dear, tis a frolic. But if you have a mind to it, I don't care. Well, the time was appointed. We had a rich coach, very good horses, a coachman, postillion, and two footmen in very good liveries, a gentleman on horseback, and a page with a feather in his hat upon another horse. The servants all called him my lord, and the innkeepers, you may be sure, did the like. And I was her honour, the countess. And thus we travelled to Oxford and a very pleasant journey we had. For, give him his due, not a beggar alive knew better how to be a lord than my husband. We saw all the rarities at Oxford, talked with two or three fellows of college about putting out a young nephew that was left to his lordship's care, to the university, and of their being his tutors. We diverted ourselves with pandering several other poor scholars, with the hopes of being at least his lordship's chaplains and putting on a scarf. And thus having lived like quality indeed, as to expense, we went away for Northampton, and, in a word, in about twelve days' ramble, came home again, to the tune of about ninety-three pounds expense.
Vanity is the perfection of a pop. My husband had this excellence that he valued nothing of expense, and as his history, you may be sure, has very little weight in it. Tis enough to tell you that in about two years and a quarter he broke and was not so happy to get over into the mint, but got into a sponging house, being arrested in an action too heavy from him to give bail to, so he sent for me to come to him. It was no surprise to me, for I had foreseen some time that all was going to wreck, and had been taking care to reserve something if I could, though it was not much for myself. But when he sent for me, he behaved much better than I expected, and told me plainly he had played the fool, and suffered himself to be surprised, which he might have prevented, that now he foresaw he could not stand it and therefore he would have me go home, and in the night take away everything I had in the house of any value, and secure it. And after that, he told me that if I could get away one hundred or two hundred pounds in goods out of the shop, I should do it. Only, says he, let me know nothing of it, neither what you take, nor whither you carry it. For as for me, says he, I am resolved to get out of this house and be gone, and if you never hear of me more, my dear, says he, I wish you well. I am only sorry for the injury I have done you. He said some very handsome things to me indeed at parting, for I told you he was a gentleman, and that was all the benefit I had of his being so, that he used me very handsomely and with good manners upon all occasions, even to the last. Only spent all I had and left me to rob the creditors for something to subsist on. However, I did as he bade me. That, you may be sure. And having thus taken my leave of him, I never saw him more, for he found means to break out of the bailiff's house that night, or the next, and go over into France, and for the rest of the creditors scrambled for it as well as they could. How I knew not, for I could come at no knowledge of anything more than this, had he come home about three o'clock in the morning, caused the rest of his goods to be removed into the mint, and the shop to be shut up, and having raised what money he could get together, he got over, as I said, to France, from whence I had one or two letters from him, and no more. I did not see him when he came home, for he having given me such instructions as above, and I having made the best of my time, I had no more business back home again at the house not knowing, but I might have been stopped there by the creditors, for a commission of bankrupt being soon after issued, they might have stopped me by orders from the commissioners. But my husband, having so dexterously got out of the bailiff's house by letting himself down in a most desperate manner from almost the top of the house to the top of another building, and leaping from thence, which was almost two stories, and which was enough indeed to have broken his neck, he came home and got away his goods before the creditors could come to seize. That is to say, before they could get out the commission and be ready to send their officers to take possession. My husband was so civil to me, for still I say he was much of a gentleman, that in the first letter he wrote me from France, he let me know where he had pawned twenty pieces of fine Holland for thirty pounds which were really worth ninety pounds, and enclosed me the token and an order for the taking them up, paying the money which I did, and made in time above a hundred pounds of them, having leisure to cut them and sell them, some and some, to private families, as opportunity offered. However, with all this and all that I had secured before, I found, upon casting things up, my case was very much altered, and my fortune much lessened, for including the Hollands and a parcel of fine muslins, which I carried off before, and some plate and other things, I found I could hardly muster up five hundred pounds, and my condition was very odd, for though I had no child, I had had one by a gentleman draper, but it was buried. Yet I was a widow bewitched. I had a husband, and no husband, and I could not pretend to marry again, though I knew well enough my husband would never see England any more if he lived fifty years. Thus, I say, 
I was limited from marriage, what offer might soever be made me. And I had not one friend to advise with in the condition I was in. Least not one I just trust the secret of my circumstances to. For if the commissioners were to have been informed where I was, I should have been fetched up and examined upon oath, and all I have saved be taken away from me. Upon these apprehensions, the first thing I did was to go quite out of my knowledge and go by another name. This I did effectually, for I went into the mint, too, took lodgings in a very private place, and called myself Mrs. Flanders. Here, however, I concealed myself, and though my new acquaintances knew nothing of me, yet I soon got a great deal of company about me. And whether it be that women are scarce among the sorts of people that generally are to be found there, or that some consolations in their miseries of the place are more requisite than on other occasions, I soon found an agreeable woman was exceedingly valuable among the sons of affliction there, and that those that wanted money to pay half a crown on the bound to their creditors, and that run in debt at the sign of the bull for their dinners, would yet find money for a supper if they liked the woman. However, I kept myself safe yet, though I began, like my Lord Rochester's mistress, that loved his company, but would not admit him father, to have the scandal of a whore, without the joy, and upon this score, tired with the place, and indeed with the company, too, I began to think of removing. It was indeed a subject of strange reflection to me, to see men who were overwhelmed in perplexed circumstances, who were reduced some degrees below being ruined, whose families were objects of their own terror and other people's charity. Yet, while a penny lasted, nay, even beyond it, endeavoring to drown themselves, laboring to forget former things, which now it was the proper time to remember, making more work for repentance, and sinning on as a remedy for sin past. But it is none of my talent to preach, these men were too wicked, even for me. There was something horrid and absurd in their way of sinning, for it was all a force, even upon themselves. They did not only act against conscience, but against nature. They put a rape upon their temper to drown the reflections, which their circumstances continually gave them and nothing was more easy than to see how sighs would interrupt their songs, and paleness and anguish sit upon their brows in spite of the forced smiles they put on. Nay, sometimes it would break out at their very mouths when they had parted with their money for a lewd treat or a wicked embrace. I have heard them, turning about, fetch a deep sigh and cry, What a dog I am! Well, Betty, my dear, I'll drink thy health, though, meaning the honest wife, that perhaps had not a half-crown for herself and three or four children. The next morning they are at their penitentials again, and perhaps the poor weeping wife comes over to him, either brings him some account of what his creditors are doing, or how she and the children are, turned out of doors, or some other dreadful news, and this adds to his self-reproaches. But when he has thought and poured on it till he is almost mad, having no principles to support him, nothing within him or above him to comfort him, but finding it all darkness on every side, he flies to the same relief again, to drink it away, to botch it away, and falling into company of men in just the same condition with himself, he repeats the crime, and thus he goes every day one step onward of his way to destruction. I was not wicked enough for such fellows as these yet. On the contrary, I began to consider here very seriously what I had to do, how things stood with me, and what course I ought to take. I knew I had no friends, no, not one friend or relation in the world, and that little I had left apparently wasted which, when it was gone, I saw nothing but misery and starving was before me. Upon these considerations, I say, and filled with horror at the place I was in and the dreadful objects which I had always before me, I resolved to be gone. I had made an acquaintance 
with a very sober, good sort of a woman, who is a widow too, like me, but in better circumstances. Her husband had been a captain of a merchant ship, and having had the misfortune to be cast away coming home on a voyage from the West Indies, which would have been very profitable if he had come safe, was so reduced by the loss that though he had saved his life then, it broke his heart, and killed him afterwards, and his widow, being pursued by the creditors, was forced to take shelter in the mint. She soon made things up with the help of friends, and was at liberty again, and finding that I rather was there to be concealed than by any particular prosecutions, and finding also that I agreed with her, or rather she with me, in a just abhorrence of the place and of the company, she invited me to go home with her till I could put myself in some posture of settling in the world to my mind, with all telling me that it was ten to one but some good captain of a ship might take a fancy to me and court me in that part of the town where she lived. I accepted her offer and was with her half a year, and should have been longer, but in that interval what she proposed to me happened to herself, and she married very much to her advantage. But whose fortune soever was upon the increase, mine seemed to be upon the wane, and I found nothing present except two or three boatswain or such fellows. As for the commanders, they were generally of two sorts. One, such as, having good business, that is to say, a good ship, resolved not to marry but with advantage, that is, with a good fortune. Two, such as, being out of employ, wanted a wife to help them to a ship. I mean, a wife who, having some money, could enable them to hold, as they call it, a good part of a ship themselves, so to encourage owners to come in. Or, a wife who, if she had not money, had friends who were concerned in shipping, and so could help to put the young man into a good ship, which to them is as good as a portion, and neither of these was my case so I looked like one that was to lie on hand. This knowledge I soon learned by experience, that the state of things was altered as to matrimony, and that I was not to expect at London what I had found in the country, that marriages were here the consequences of politic schemes, performing interests, and carrying on business, and that love had no share, or but very little in the matter, that as my sister-in-law in Colchester had said, beauty, wit, manners, sense, good humor, good behavior, education, virtue, piety, or any other qualification, whether of body or mind, had no power to recommend, that money only made a woman agreeable, that men chose mistresses indeed by the gust of their affection, and it was requisite to a whore, to be handsome, well-shaped, have a good mien, and a graceful behavior, but that for a wife, no deformity would shock the fancy, no ill qualities the judgment, the money was the thing, the portion was neither crooked nor monstrous, but the money was always agreeable, whatever the wife was. On the other hand, as the market ran very unhappily on the men's side, I found the woman had lost the privilege of saying no, that it was a favor now for a woman to have the question asked, and if any young lady had so much arrogance as to counterfeit a negative, she never had the opportunity given her denying twice, much less of recovering that false step, and accepting what she had but seemed to decline. The men had such choice everywhere, that the case of the women was very unhappy, for they seemed to ply at every door, and if the man was by great chance refused at one house, he was sure to be received at the next. Besides this, I observed that the men made no scruple to set themselves out, and to go of fortune-hunting, as they called it, when they really had no fortune themselves to demand it, or merit to deserve it and that they carried it so high that a woman was scarce allowed to inquire after the character or estate of the person that pretended to her. This I had an example of in a young lady in the next house to me, and with whom I had contracted an intimacy. 
she was courted by a young captain and though she had near two thousand pounds to her fortune she did but inquire of some of his neighbors about his character his morals or substance and he took occasion at the next visit to let her know truly that he took it very ill and that he should not give her the trouble of his visits any more i heard of it and i had begun my acquaintance with her i went to see her upon it she entered into a close conversation with me about it and unbosomed herself very freely i perceived presently that though she thought herself very ill-used yet she had no power to resent it and was exceedingly piqued that she had lost him and particularly that another of less fortune had gained him i fortified her mind against such meanness as i called it i told her that as low as i was in the world i would have despised a man that should think i ought to take him upon his own recommendation only without having the liberty to inform myself of his fortune or of his character also i told her that as she had a good fortune she had no need to stoop to the disaster of the time that it was enough that the men could insult us that had but little money to recommend us but if she suffered such an affront to pass upon her without resenting it she would be rendered low prized upon all occasions and would be the contempt of all the women in that part of the town that a woman can never want an opportunity to be revenged of a man that has used her ill and that there were ways enough to humble such a fellow as that or else certainly women were the most unhappy creatures in the world i found that she was very well pleased with the discourse and she told me seriously that she would be very glad to make him sensible of her just resentment and either to bring him on again or have the satisfaction of her revenge being as public as possible i told her that if she would take my advice i would tell her how she should obtain her wishes in both those things and that i would bring the man to her door again and make him beg to be let in she smiled at that and soon let me see that if he came to her door her resentment was not so great as to give her leave to let him stand long there however she listened very willingly to my offer of advice so i told her that the first thing she ought to do was a piece of justice to herself namely that whereas she had been told by several people that he had reported among the ladies that he had left her and pretended to give the advantage of the negative to himself she should take care to have it well spread among the women which she could not fail of an opportunity to do in a neighborhood so addicted to family news as that she lived in that she had inquired into his circumstances and found he was not the man as to a state he pretended to be let them be told madam said i that you had been well informed that he was not the man that you expected and that you thought it was not safe to meddle with him that you heard he was of an ill temper and that he boasted how he had used the women ill upon many occasions and that particularly he was debauched in his morals etc the last of which indeed had some truth in it but at the same time i did not find that she seemed to like him much the worse for that part as i had put this into her head she came most readily into it immediately she went to work to find instruments and she had very little difficulty in the search for telling her story in general to a couple of gossips in the neighborhood it was the chat of the tea-table all over that part of the town and i met with it wherever i visited also as it was known that i was acquainted with the young lady herself my opinion was asked very often and i confirmed it with all the necessary aggravations and set out his character in the blackest colors and then as a piece of secret intelligence i added as what the other gossips knew nothing of that i had learned he was in very bad circumstances that he was under a necessity of a fortune to support his interest with the owners of the ship he commanded that his own part was not paid for and if it was not paid quickly his owners would put him out of the ship and his chief mate was likely to command it 
who offered to buy that part which the captain had promised to take. I added, or I confess I was heartily piqued at the rogue, as I called him, that I had heard a rumor, too, that he had a wife alive at Plymouth, and another in the West Indies, a thing which they all knew was not very uncommon for such kind of gentleman. This worked as we both desired it, for presently the young lady next door, who had a father and mother that governed both her and her fortune, was shut up, and her father forbid him the house. Also, in one place more where he went, the woman had the courage, however strange it was, to say no, and he could try nowhere, but he was reproached with his pride, and that he pretended not to give the women leave to inquire into his character and the like. Well, by this time he began to be sensible of his mistake, and having alarmed all the women on that side of the water, he went over to Ratcliffe and got access to some of the ladies there. But though the young women there, too, were, according to the fate of the day, pretty willing to be asked, yet such was his ill luck that his character followed him over the water, and his good name was much the same there as it was on our side. So that though he might have had wives enough, yet it did not happen among the women that had good fortunes, which was what he wanted. But this was not all. She very ingeniously managed another thing herself, for she got a young gentleman, who, as a relation, and was indeed a married man, to come and visit her two or three times a week, in a very fine chariot and good liveries, and her two agents, and I also, presently spread a report all over that this gentleman came to court her, that he was a gentleman of a thousand pounds a year, and that he had fallen in love with her, and that she was going to her aunt's in the city, because it was inconvenient for the gentleman to come to her with his coach in Redriff, the streets being so narrow and difficult. This took immediately. The captain was laughed at in all companies, and was ready to hang himself. He tried all the ways possible to come at her again, and wrote the most passionate letters to her in the world, excusing his former rashness, and, in short, by great application, obtained leave to wait on her again, as he said, to clear his reputation. At this meeting she had her full revenge of him, for she told him she wondered what he took her to be, that she should admit any man to a treaty of so much consequence as that to marriage, without inquiring very well into his circumstances, that if he thought she was to be huffed into wedlock, and that she was in the same circumstances which her neighbors might be in, to take up with the first good Christian that came, he was mistaken. That, in a word, his character was really bad, or he was very ill beholden to his neighbors, and that unless he could clear up some points in which she had justly been prejudiced, she had no more to say to him but to do herself justice and give him the satisfaction of knowing that she was not afraid to say no, either to him or any man else. With that, she told him what she had heard, or rather raised herself by my means, of his character, his not having paid for the part he pretended to own of the ship he commanded, of the resolution of his owners to put him out of the command, and to put his mate in his stead, and of the scandal raised on his morals his having been reproached with such and such women, and having a wife at Plymouth, and in the West Indies, and the like. And she asked him whether he could deny that she had good reason, if these things were not cleared up, to refuse him, and in the meantime to insist upon having satisfaction in points too significant as they were. He was so confounded at her discourse that he could not answer a word, and she almost began to believe that all was true by his disorder, though at the same time she knew that she had been the raiser of all these reports herself. After some time he recovered himself a little, and from that time became the most humble, the most modest, and most importunate man alive in his courtship. She carried her jest on a great way. She asked him, if he thought she was so at her last shift, 
that she could or ought to bear such treatment and if he did not see that she did not want those who thought it worth their while to come farther to her than he did meaning the gentleman whom she had brought to visit her by way of sham she brought him by these tricks to submit to all possible measures to satisfy her as well of his circumstances as of his behavior he brought her undeniable evidence of his having paid for his part of the ship he brought her certificates from his owners that the report of their intending to remove him from the command of the ship and put his chief mate in was false and groundless in short he was quite the reverse of what he was before thus i convinced her that if the men made their advantage of our sex in the affair of marriage upon the supposition of there being such choice to be had and of the women being so easy it was only owing to this that the women wanted courage to maintain their ground and to play their part and that according to my lord rochester a woman's ne'er so ruined that she can revenge herself on her undoer man after these things this young lady played her part so well that though she resolved to have him and that indeed having him was the main bent of her design yet she made his obtaining her be to him the most difficult thing in the world and this she did not by a haughty reserved carriage but by a just policy turning the tables upon him and playing back upon him his own game for as he pretended by a kind of lofty carriage to place himself above the occasion of a character and to make inquiring into his character a kind of an affront to him she broke with him upon that subject and at the same time that she made him submit to all possible inquiry after his affairs she apparently shut the door against his looking into her own it was enough to him to obtain her for a wife as to what she had she told him plainly that as he knew her circumstances it was but just that she should know his and though at the same time he had only known her circumstances by common fame yet he had made so many protestations of his passion for her that he could ask no more but her hand to his grand request and the like ramble according to the custom of lovers in short he left himself no room to ask any more questions about her estate and she took the advantage of it like a prudent woman for she placed part of her fortune so in trustees without letting him know anything of it that it was quite out of his reach and made him be very well content with the rest it is true she was pretty well besides that is to say she had about fourteen hundred pounds in money which she gave him and the other after some time she brought to light as a prerequisite to herself which he was to accept as a mighty favor seeing though it was not to be his it might ease him in the article of her particular expenses and i must add that by this conduct the gentleman himself became not only the more humble in his applications to her to obtain her but also was much the more an obliging husband to her when he had her i cannot but remind the ladies here how much they placed themselves below the common station of a wife which if i may be allowed not to be partial is low enough already i say they place themselves below their common station and prepare their own mortifications by their submitting so to be insulted by the men beforehand which i confess i see no necessity of this relation may serve therefore to let the lady see that the advantage is not so much on the other side as the men think it is and though it may be true that the men have but too much choice among us and that some women may be found who will dishonor themselves be cheap and easy to come at and will scarce wait to be asked yet if they will have women as i may say worth having they may find them as uncomfortable as ever and that those that are otherwise are a sort of people 
that have such deficiencies when add as rather recommend the ladies that are difficult than encourage the men to go on with their easy courtship and expect wives equally valuable that will come at first call nothing is more certain than that the ladies always gain of the men by keeping their ground and letting their pretended lovers see they can resent being slighted and that they are not afraid of saying no they i observe insult us mightily with telling us of the number of women that the wars and the sea and trade and other incidents have carried the men so much away that there is no proportion between the numbers of the sexes and therefore the women have the disadvantage but i am far from granting that the number of women is so great or the number of men so small but if they will have me tell the truth the disadvantage of the women is a terrible scandal upon the men and it lies here and here only namely that the age is so wicked and the sex so debauched that in short the number of such men as an honest woman ought to meddle with is small indeed and it is but here and there that a man is to be found who is fit for a woman to venture upon but the consequence even of that too amounts to no more than this that women ought to be the more nice for how do we know the just character of the man that makes the offer to say that the woman should be the more easy on this occasion is to say we should be the forwarder to venture because of the greatness of the danger which in my way of reasoning is very absurd on the contrary the women have ten thousand times the more reason to be wary and backward by how much the hazard of being betrayed is the greater and would the ladies consider this and act the wary part they would discover every cheat that offered for in short the lives of very few men nowadays will bear a character and if the ladies do but make a little inquiry they will soon be able to distinguish the men and deliver themselves as for women that do not think their own safety worth their thought that impatient of their perfect state resolve as they call it to take the first good christian that comes that run into matrimony as a horse rushes into the battle i can say nothing to them but this that they are the sort of ladies that ought to be prayed for among the rest of distempered people and to me they look like people that venture their whole estates in a lottery where there is a hundred thousand blanks to one prize no man of common sense will value a woman the less for not giving up herself at the first attack or for accepting his proposal without inquiring into his person or character on the contrary he must think her the weakest of all creatures in the world as the rate of men now goes in short he must have a very contemptible opinion of her capacities nay every of her understanding that having but one case of her life shall call that life away at once and make matrimony like death be a leap into the dark i would fain have the conduct of my sex a little regulated in this particular which is a thing in which of all the parts of life i think at this time we suffer most in tis nothing but lack of courage the fear of not being married at all and of that frightful state of life called an old maid of which i have a story to tell by itself this i say is the woman's snare but would the ladies once but get above that fear and manage rightly they would more certainly avoid it by standing their ground in a case so absolutely necessary to their felicity that by exposing themselves as they do and if they did not marry so soon as they may do otherwise they would make themselves amends by marrying safer she is always married too soon who gets a bad husband and she is never married too late who gets a good one in a word there is no woman deformity or lost reputation excepted but if she manages well may be married safely one time or other 
but if she precipitates herself it is ten thousand to one but she is undone end of section six all librivox recordings are in the public domain